Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Learning Lives Forever webinar with Sean Allen McCaw. Uh, as, as you all know, Sean's a Hall of Famer here at SGU, and we're so excited to have him uh, share his experiences overseas in Europe playing basketball and coaching and uh, some things that he has learned along the way. So, Sean, uh, take it away. Okay, so hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone here. Um, as you see, I'm I'm in a classroom right now. I decided to come to my to my school, to my class, um, because I didn't want to wake everyone up in my house since it's midnight here, a little bit past midnight here, and everybody has to work. Uh, so I figured I'd just come to my school and do it from here, which is kind of a um, a nice thing that fits into to the theme of learning lives forever. Um, so I hope uh, I hope everything will go pretty well. Um, some people may be wondering why I have the name McCall when actually all through college or actually my whole life almost, I went through um, with the name Allen. Brief story on that is that um, after I finished at Southern Utah, I was coming to, to Europe and I got my passport and realized that my legal name was not Allen. Allen is my stepfather's name and because he didn't, he didn't formally adopt me. Um, I had to go by the name of McCall because I had to go really fast to, to Austria. Um, and then I just never changed it. So that's why um, it's a kind of funny story because everybody in America knows me as Sean Allen, but everybody in Europe knows me as Sean McCall. So I kind of joke with everyone and tell them that, that I was in a FBI witness protection program and I had to change my identity. So that's the story why, why everybody calls me Sean McCall here. Um, for the webinar tonight, um, I would like to do three phases. Um, first, the SCU years, then my European years, and actually then life after basketball. Um, and between each, between each um, part, I would like to do a little question round. Um, so if you, wanna, if you wanna ask me anything, when it's time and jot something down and, and just go ahead and, and ask. But um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, learning lives forever is the theme. And what does it mean? Um, I gave a lot of thought to that. And I think to each person, it'll have a different meaning. Um, but for me, it means that people are constantly learning and adapting during, dis during different stages of their lives. Um, and without learning how to adapt, without learning this this very crucial thing for your life you run the risk of becoming stagnant um, or only experiencing the same things that you've always experienced in a sort of repeat mode um, and that's the theme that'll replay itself throughout my presentation right now and um, it'll show how the lessons that i learned from southern utah how it's kind of helped me throughout my my whole life and and the things that I've been able to accomplish since I since I left Cedar. So when we talk about the SUU years, um, the story of how I came to Southern Utah to Cedar actually starts two years before. Um, I, out of high school, I went to University of Arizona. I had a terrible time there and left and went to Dixie, which was still a junior college at that time. Um, and there I met a family who kind of adopted me and also a, a, another former SU Hall of Famer in, in Fred House, but I was the first one. And this family kind of adopted me and took care of me while I was at Dixie, the Sipe Boyer clan. I don't, I don't see anybody here from them right now, no. But they um, were basically my family out there. And Southern Utah actually never recruited me because uh, Coach Evans, uh, thought that I would be out of their league and that I would never come there. And so he never really even recruited me. But I came up to Cedar for a spring football game because I knew someone who was playing on the, on the, on the football team. And, and he was like, hey, why don't you stay here? Um, we're having a party afterwards. You know, have a good time. I ended up running into Coach Evans at the game. And he jokingly said, like, hey, um, would you like to take a visit? And I thought, okay, that means if I get if I take a visit, I can stay for the party. I had one visit left over, and yeah, so I said, okay, let's do it. And his jaw just dropped because he totally didn't expect for me to, to say anything like that. And then 
breaks out his phone and he makes some phone calls and, and it, that's how it happened. And then um, I had a, actually a really, really great visit. And it was my first visit of what should have been five. Um, and I had some really big schools that were after me, uh, Wake Forest, uh, USC, New Mexico State, um, and a couple other ones. But I was, um, I was a little bit wary of going back to a big school. So I, I'll, I'll never forget, I called um, the mom from this family, her name is Edie. And um, it was the day before the visit was over. And I, I think it was like 11 o'clock at night and I called and I was telling her my reservations and I told her that the, the visit at Southern Utah, Utah was really good. And it was everything what I was kind of looking for, but I wasn't so sure because it wasn't an established program. And of course I had dreams of going to the NBA. So it was like, okay, well, how would that fit in? Um, and um, she told me something that, that, is, that stuck with me that night and it stuck with me my whole life. She told me, Sean, sometimes it's okay to be a big fish in a small pond. And that really hit me that Southern Utah and Cedar was everything that I was looking for. So why not? And um, so I ended, up, I ended up signing my letter of intent. Um, I, the coaches, they left me a, a folder with, uh, with information about Southern Utah and, and also the letter of intent inside. But of course, no one expected me to sign it. And so I ended up signing it after I talked to Edie. And that meant I had to cancel all my other trips and stuff like that, but that, that came later. So I signed the letter of intent and um, Coach Bobby Lau came to pick me up in the morning and that was gonna be the end of the visit and I was gonna go meet with Coach, with Coach Evans. And um, so I gave him the, 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 this folder and, I, and he didn't look at it, he didn't look inside. I said, hey, you might want to, might want to take a peek inside, and so he opens it and he sees the the letter of intent right there, and he just gave me the biggest bear hug, and that that was like the the moment where I knew I made the right decision, um, and I never once regretted it regretted it after that. Um, I've got a lot of fond memories of Cedar. Uh, for me, I think this was the start of this learning lives forever forever theme for me because. I'm a Las Vegas kid, I'm a city kid. And um, so I had experienced a lot of new things like hiking. I'm a Vegas kid, I don't hike. Um, snow, it snows once every 10 years in Vegas. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a new environment being one of the only African-American -Ameri athletes there. Um, and, uh, but in general, I had no problems, quite, quite the opposite. And, um, I think back then the school wasn't as diverse as it is now. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Southern Utah even has a African-American student body, student body president, I believe um, right now. And I, and I see lots of, lots of things online and I'm really, really pleased with that development. Um, but at the same time, I had, to, I had to adapt to be successful. There was no way that I was gonna live my life and, and do the things that I had done previously without changing life and basketball in itself um, was going to change change for me um, but I had really great teammates that made my my adaptation um, much easier um, many of whom I still talk to and have contact with today um, there was Daryl Benson who was the heart of the team um, he had also had the largest collection of Disney movies I've ever seen. <laughs> um, there was Vic Saunders. He was kind of like a big enforcer because I'm really like skinny and he was big and he protected me. Um, then there was Keith Shaggy Berard who was easily uh, the, the most versatile on the team and probably one of the funniest. Um, then there was Jimmy Faulkner who, who um, ended up being my getaway partner during spring break, um, which kind of threw a mattress from one of the dorms into his old VW uh, uh, van and drove to Lake Powell for, for spring break. And he's also actually come to see me in, in, in Geneva when I was playing in Geneva. Um, and so we've also been in contact. Then there was Donnie McDade who, who was extremely, extremely underrated as a player. Um, it's interesting because people used to think we were brothers because we're both really skinny. Um, now he's not so skinny, but in a good way, he's like totally buffed and I'm still very skinny. Um, 
And then there was also uh, someone else that everybody should know, Lindy Larson, number zero, zero, the best Southern Utah basketball player of all time, man or woman. Um, she's, a, she's also been a, a really good friend of mine since back then, since back in the days. Um, and so I had a lot of people that made my transition a lot easier. Um, a lot of people also ask me my, my, my most memorable moments at Southern Utah and actually have two of them. Um, the, first, the first one was, I think it was my senior year. Yeah, my senior year when we had, uh, the school had a talent show and they held a talent show inside the Centrum, where I guess it's not called the Centrum anymore. Um, and uh, me, Donnie, Daryl, Shaggy, and Vic, we performed um, the Jackson 5's Rock and Robin. We had the big Afro wigs, we had uh, um, crazy clothes, it was hilarious. Um, and I've, I've seen it, I've seen that Daryl posted it on Instagram um, a couple years ago, so I might have to report that to get it taken off because it's quite embarrassing. My, my dance moves were not very good. But we had a lot of fun, and that was just one of those one of those um, things that was definitely out of my comfort zone um, that I experienced. Um, and one of those things in front of all those people in the central, um, on the on the, the middle of the court, just uh, doing something that I wouldn't normally do, just because I had really good people around me to to help me um, get over my fear or or whatever. Um, so that was one. And uh, the second one was um, winning the now defunct American West Conference tournament title in, in Cedar. We had it in Cedar and that was in 1995. And the special thing about that was not only that it was held in Cedar, um, but my mom and dad were there. They, they rented a big bus um, with, with all their friends. They all had on these t-shirts these that said uh, my number, I think on the back and like mom, dad, uncle or whatever was on the, on the front and stuff like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I won in tournament MVP. Um, and so that was uh, another moment that was really, really, yeah, one of those things that stayed with you for a long, long time, you know, and, um, and, and winning on that level um, was also like the, the thing that I needed um, that showed that I really made the correct decision um, and, and going to Southern Utah in the first place. And yeah, I mean, I had a, a really good career at Southern Utah. I was, um, my first year we were, we were still an independent school and I was on the all independent team. Um, then the second year we were in, in the American West Conference um, and we won that title. And just all around, I had a, a really good experience in, in, in Cedar and also St. George while I was there as well. A um, lot of fond memories, a lot of people that I still talk to. And yeah, that was, uh, that was a very important part of my, my life, my, my develop, a point where in my development that was probably at the beginning that kind of transitioned to, to where, where I am now. So yeah, um, I guess now we can open up for questions if anybody has anything. Don't be shy, I don't bite. Sean, I'd be interested to know what was yep. the most important lesson you learned from Bill Evans? Ooh, um, I, I learned quite a lot from him. He, um, I still talk to him occasionally, even today. Um, I know where he's at. I, I actually talk to his son a lot, Trajan. Um, <sighs> Coach Evans was very unorthodox. Um, and uh, he was real old school, which was, was a total contrast to my city kid life. Um, very discipline orientated. And um, I, I would say if there was one thing that I really remember about him as a coach, what I also used when I coached um, was just the, the, the people aspect, how he talked to his players, how he, how he um, communicated with them. Um, it was more than it was more than just player coach. 
at least I can say that for myself. There was more to it. And I, I think that's why our, our friendship has continued um, all these years. Um, he, he maybe saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And he communicated that to me in a way that that was almost um, almost like father-like. So I think the, the biggest thing that I learned from him is how to communicate with your players and make them feel special, how to make them feel like um, a part of the team, an important part of the team, whether you were the leading scorer or a guy coming off the bench playing two minutes. I threw it in chat. Uh, sorry if there's some cars whizzing by. Oh. So, uh, I'm going to go do a quick drop off. But uh, when are you going to come visit uh, Cedar City next? Uh, would, would love to see you. Well, you know, how often do you get back over here? Uh, well, I mean, um, I don't get back very often. Uh, I think the last time, whew, the last time I was in Cedar was probably about. 20 years ago, a good 20 year, Coach Evans was still there. I, I worked at the camp, the summer camp. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a good 20, maybe 18, 19 years ago. Um, I don't get back to, to America very often. Um, I was born in New York, but I was raised in Vegas from the time I was five. So I still have a lot of family in New York. Um, and you can always get cheap flights to New York from Europe. So um, I've been there a couple of times in the last years. Um, but I don't even get to Vegas. I haven't been to Vegas in also probably, probably 19 years. Um, I don't get to Vegas. No, that's not true. I was probably in Vegas about 15 years ago, um, the last time. So I don't get back to the States period very often um, because I live in the center of Europe, you know, and when I'm, when I'm off from work, then I'm traveling around Europe and it's way cheaper <laughs> and, um, I, I would like to come back to Cedar um, at some point. It's just got to be one of those times when I when I hit Vegas. But I but I, I'll make sure when I when I do come back to to when I come back to Vegas that I'll that I'll make a, a run out there as well. Hey Sean, <laughs> Seb here. Um, hey. Question for you. You were talking about being a big fish in a small pond. Now, knowing what you know, um, what would be your advice to collegiates playing high schools, looking for college? Would you have any advice on what to look for, big college or HCBU, which is kind of trending now? Um, mm -hmm. What would be your insights and your advice? Um, I think everybody, everybody has to look at their own situation. If I had it to do all over again, um, I was a I was a top I was a real top high school player, um, and so I had a lot of interest from a lot of colleges, and I ended up going to University of Arizona, which was at the, at the time ranked number two, number one in the nation, um, and then of course the year after I left, they won the national championship. But um, I would say investigate and don't do it. Don't go to a school just because it's a big school or or something like that. Um, if I had it to do all over again, I probably would. I probably would not have gone to Arizona. I probably would have, um, or I should have investigated it more to see the the coaching style, the the style of play. Um, uh, for me, Arizona was was like my school. Like I idolized Sean Elliott, who played there, and and that was like my school. Them and UNLV. Um, I I could have gone to UNLV, but I didn't want to stay home. So that left like Arizona, you know, because that was my school. And I think I did it more because of nostalgia than actual um, being informed. And I think nowadays it's a lot easier with technology to inform yourself. And I would, I would say that's probably the, the, the main thing that any athlete in any, any um, sport should do, to choose based on, on how it suits them, how that school suits them. And if it doesn't suit them, then they shouldn't go. Sean, we've got Mindy K. Larson asking on Facebook, 
<laughs> how did you develop your shot blocking skills or did it come naturally? <laughs> I watched Mindy. <laughs> um, I, I guess that was a more of a timing thing. I was, I was back in the day when I was young, I was pretty athletic and I, I really enjoyed the defensive part of it. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's just timing and luck. Um, I don't think you can really practice it, but I think I was just lucky that I had a, a pretty good timing on, on shots. And I have to admit um, that, that the style of play we had um, was very conducive for me because we forced everything to me. So I was the last line of defense. So it was easier for me to, to block a lot of shots. Uh, but I, I, it was a lot luck. So should I move on, Ron? Yeah, let's move on to the next section, Sean. That'll be great. Okay. So now we'll talk about um, my European years. Um, yeah, this is pretty interesting. I've played or I played as a professional for 13 years in six different countries. Um, all right, let me see if I get this correct. I played in Austria for five years. Then I went to Paris. Then I was in France for one year. Then I was in Portugal for one year. Then I was in England one year. Then I was in Switzerland. And lastly, I was a player three years in Germany. So um, I ended up winning three titles in Austria and I think one in Germany. Yes, one in Germany. And um, over those years, and it was a, it was a roller coaster. It was really, um, first of all, there's no comparison to the NBA. Uh, there's absolutely no comparison to European basketball, um, especially back then um, in, in 95 when I first came over um, to the NBA. Nothing. The basketball, the, the salaries, um, things like that. Although now there's some clubs that play, pay really, really good money. And, and also the Euro League is, is very competitive basketball. And you've even had um, a lot of European teams beat NBA teams when they travel over in the preseasons as well. Um, but for me, um, I, it, was, it was a great ride. I, I got to see a lot of places. I got to live in Paris. I got to live on the island of Madeira. Um, um, I lived in Geneva. Um, at, like I've been to a lot of places that, that I would have never dreamed of um, before. And um, so that was a, a, a very great thing for me to experience. And um, after I, after I played those nine years, um, I went right into, right into coaching, which is a, a funny story in itself. Um, my last season of playing, halfway through the season, um, they fired the coach. And we knew that that was gonna be my last season and that I would come on as an assistant coach to the coach that got fired. But because we weren't that good, um, we didn't have so much money. They asked me if I wanted to take over as coach. So, which is literally unheard of. I've never heard of a, another situation where a, where a player mid season ended up being the head coach. I've never heard of that. I've heard some really crazy stories in Europe, but not something like that. So, um, I originally said no. And then after like a week and a half, um, I figured, Hey, that's what I wanted to do anyway. And this is without pressure and I can learn a lot. And, and, you know, I'm a leader rather than a follower. So this is the, a great chance for me to, to do what I wanted to do. So that was also a big adjustment um, for me and how to how also with the theme of, of learning lives forever, because I had to learn on the fly. I had to learn right away. It was very difficult to be um, teammates with a lot of these guys for like two years that I had been playing there and then overnight switch over to being their coach that was very odd um but i threw everything into it and the guys respected me anyway i was one of the oldest on the team and um um everyone knew that i was going to coach one day anyway so it was it was a weird transition but for me it worked 
And um, yeah, and so that was a, a thing that I had to learn really on the fly to, to change my suit and, and to, to learn while I was learning by doing and, and really um, think like a coach. And it, it was an adjustment for me for a while. Uh, I'll never forget when we would practice, um, usually coaches, when, they, when, when, when teams are practicing, coaches go on the sideline and they're watching from the sideline because that's their vantage point during the game, it's normal. So they go to where they would normally stand. And for me, the first weeks, um, I would stand on the court. I would give directions and, and instructions by being on the court. So I would of course get in the way and, and people would run into me and it was like, hey, get off the court, what are you doing, you know? And um, so I had to learn, I had to learn that that is not my place anymore. I am not a player anymore. I, my vantage point is on the sideline, you know? So that was a that was an interesting thing for me to, to learn on the fly. Um, and, and I think part of my career in, in, at Southern Utah maybe prepared, prepared me for that just a little bit because my junior season, I was our leading scorer and I think I was averaging uh, 17, 18 points a game. And of course, as a senior, you think, okay, this is my year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to average 20, 25 points or, or whatever, you know? Um, and uh, Coach Evan sat me down um, in the preseason my senior year and told me, hey, we got a better team than we had last year. You're gonna, your role is going to change. And I'm like, what? Now, come on. Are you kidding me? Come on. I'm, I'm leading scorer. I'm, I'm the best player on the team. What are you talking about? Um, and he told me really bluntly, like, no, this team is better and we have a chance to be better. So you're going to have to change. You're going to have to adapt. And your role will be different. You will probably remain the, the leading scorer, but um, you will not get the same amount of shots. You might play a little bit less. And that at first was a shock for me, but he explained it in a way that it was the best thing for the team. And in the end, um, by the time I walked out of the office, I wasn't angry, but it was a new challenge for me. And so that related back to when I started coaching and that was an incredible challenge for me um, to do that. I was on coaching on the, the biggest stage in Germany. And I had never coached a game before in my life. And um, so that was a, 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 a massive moment for me to coach um, on, on such a level and, and from one day to the next. And, but it was the same like with, with Coach Evans. It was basically from one day to the next, my role had changed. And yeah. So the, another part of my European experience where I, where I say, um, the learning lives forever is that while I'm over here being exposed to different cultures, there's also language difficulties or language, um, different languages that I've had to pick up um, or and it's just the evolution as a, as a person. Um, I think one of the key reasons that I played for so long was because I was always flexible. I was always, I was never the type um, to say it has to be this way or, or um, I was always willing to learn. I was always willing to adapt my game as I got older as well to, to the new situation, European lifestyle. European basketball is totally different than, than in America. In, in Europe, it's more team oriented. Over in America, it's more one-on-one it's more -on -one dominant. Um, and, and, and that's why I chose to, to stay in Europe because I had adapted so much to the European lifestyle. I, I, I was... Um, I learned German. Um, I, I, I tried to learn French while I was in Paris uh, and also in Geneva. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say I was very successful at it, but, but I, I, I tried. You know, and, um, uh, my, my best friend Sebastian is here, so he, he, he can probably vouch for the fact that I don't really speak very good French. Um, but I, I tried. And I think that goes back to it. It's like, if you don't adapt, if there were a lot of guys that were much better players than I was when I was over here. So there would be Americans coming left and right, but they would stay one, two years made maximum um, because they expected Europe to be the same as America and they weren't willing to adapt. And uh, for me, uh, I never was one that wanted to rely on other people to translate for me or, or I would wanna know what people are talking about around me. So that's why I learned German um, and I'm fluent in German. 
but it was a it was a great great lifestyle and, and and I never tried to learn Portuguese because I wasn't there long enough. Um, I was only there for one season. But when you're around new cultures, new languages, is I it's my opinion that that you have to indulge yourself. You have to really fully invest yourself in in doing in that. And and that's also a part of of why learning is 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 forever. You know, I'm con I'm constantly learning new things. Um, so I think that's a, a huge, a huge thing to, to really evolve as a person. And I think that's part of the reason why I, why I lasted so long over here. Now it's what, almost 20, 20 something years that I'm, that I'm here. Um, and I've actually given up my American citizenship. I'm no longer an American citizen. I am an Austrian citizen. I uh, played on the Austrian national team. I forgot to say that before. Um, as well for a couple of years. And um, um, I mean, of course, now I live in Germany, but, but I have strong ties to Austria as well. And uh, so, yeah, it's an it, it's, it's a evolution for me as, as I've lived over here, but, but I'm, it's, I've always wanted to constantly learn. So that helped. Um, so anybody want to ask any questions about my European years? If you got any questions about European basketball or such? We had a question from Keeler Daly in the chat. Did China have any teams going at the time that you were um, playing in Europe? And would you have liked to play in that country? Yes, China did have their league as it was going on. That was a option for me to go to China. My first year, um, I had a couple of, of I had an agent and my agent negotiated with a couple of teams and one team was in China. The money was fantastic, but for me, I didn't see myself living in China. That wasn't, that wasn't a, a option for me. Um, I had an offer from Italy, from a team in Italy, but at that time the NBA was on lockout and they wanted to try to get in a, 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 an NBA guy, which I wasn't. And um, so they kind of kept me at a distance until they could see how long the, the, the um, lockout would end. And, um, and I got impatient and I ended up going to Austria. Um, another time where I was a big fish in a small pond, but it worked out for me great. Sean, what would surprise most people of, uh, about in, as far as differences between European basketball and American basketball? Was there anything that really shocked you when you got overseas? Um, there, were, there were two things that really shocked me. Um, the first is how in America, it's very athletic based. It's very dunk, run, jump, um, things like that. And, and over here, it's a lot, it's a lot more technical and even the coaches they work they drill you on the very small details of, of, of a game what we don't really do in America um, maybe now it's it's evolving as well but back then especially I was surprised at how how team orientated it was that was the first thing the next thing was um, I was really surprised by the, the fans I mean I've got some really crazy stories about about uh, basketball fans in Europe with what you would never expect um, um, in, a, in, a, in an arena in, in America. It just wouldn't happen, these things. Um, I mean, there, it's, it's, I, I equated it a little bit to like a student section in, in, a, in a college arena, something like that, with wild and crazy kids and jumping around and, and things like that. So um, I was really surprised at the, the, the culture, the fan culture. And um, it was it was incredible. I mean, but I've got some crazy, crazy stories about about fans. But for the most part, it was it was incredible. It was really great. I don't I don't know if we're supposed to <laughs> chat or to or to verbally speak here. But maybe I'll just take a shot here and verbally speak. Uh, I I love your story. Uh, I'm an, uh, obviously an SEU grad. Uh, my son um, uh, played football here at SEU, and after he was done, he went over to Finland and played football and oh, cool. had some great experiences. You know, even though he only stayed one year, uh, he 
he was hopeful to, you know, maybe even play in the Germany leagues at, at one point in time. So builds a lot of character. You can see yeah. that in you. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We're ready for the next section, Sean. Okay. So now the, the last section will be life after basketball. So, um, yeah, what can I say? I, I, um, I, I'm married, I have wonderful kids. Um, I really settled down. And um, after I coached, I coached for nine years, another nine years. Um, and really the lifestyle of a coach is, is brutal. It's really, really tough. It was something that I always wanted to do, but um, of course, having a family, it shows you how much time you miss. And I was always thinking about the next game and, and I was home, but I was thinking about practice and how to, how to make the practice schedule or things like that. It was never ending. It's much different than as a player. As a player, you have a lot of downtime. As a professional, um, you practice two to three times a day, but, but you somehow still have, have a lot of downtime. As a coach, you're constantly thinking. And um, that really warned me, it really took its toll on me. Also the, the moving around, because as they say, uh, coaches are hired to be fired. And um, like, you're not a good coach if you haven't been fired at least once. And um, so, so of course you have to move around a lot. Maybe your contract is up, you, you move to another city. And I, I, I moved quite often as a coach as well, um, but only in Germany. Um, but I was a little bit weary or wary, I should say, um, of moving my, my family around so much. So my, the last team that I coached is actually where I live now. They have a pro team here. And um, my contract was up. And then I had to think about what I wanted to do. Um, I had an offer from the south of Germany, a team in the south of Germany, which is about six hours from here. And my wife is actually from this city where we, we live. And I came back here to coach partly because of her. So she could be around her family and the kids could be around their, their uh, grandparents and things like that. Um, but when my contract was up after three years, I had to make a decision. Did I want to continue um, the, the coaching thing and move to maybe to the south of Germany? Uh, but the family stays here. Um, it was a lot, a lot of um, uncertainties how it, would, how it would go on. And I was starting to get a little bit burned out. So I started to put some feelers out and see what I, what I could do. And here in the city, um, I live in Braunschweig, we have an international school. It's a private international school. So um, there are, in my class, there are 15 children. I do your, uh, the fifth grade. There's 15 children and we have seven or eight, I think eight nationalities from those 15 children eight different nationalities. So we well, have to imagine that, that Volkswagen, they bring in um, people to work in their company and higher up position in the company from Japan, from Mexico, from Sweden, from all over the world. And they, of course they bring their families, they're here for three years and they go back home. Um, so our school is, is English, it's a Cambridge, a Cambridge system um, from England. And um, so I put my feeler out here to see if they, would, if they needed any native speakers, if they needed any, anything. And um, I was lucky enough to get a job here. I also put some feelers out in, in Berlin because I really love Berlin. Um, and they have a lot of international schools there as well. And I ended up getting this job. I was really lucky um, and fortunate to, to get this job here. I am not a teacher per se. I am a, what they, what they call a professional educator that is basically a, uh, assistant, a teacher's assistant, but the, the, the areas, the gray areas are very intertwined to teaching. It's not just, I'm, I'm basically the first person that the kids see when they come to school and I'm the last person they see. I'm with them all day, except for when I have my break, I even go to lunch with them. So I know the kids um, in and out and it's the greatest job in the world. I think I wish, I wish I would have done this job straight out of, out of play. Because it's it's a wonderful job. I've got wonderful kids. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a really great thing um, that they do here. There's, so it's me and another teacher, or the teachers come and go. The, the the English teacher will come, teach her lesson, 
and then leave and the math teacher will come and do his lesson and then leave but I'm here with them all the time so I'm more responsible for their social well-being um, when they start acting up or when they have problems on the on the playground with another, another kid or I'm the one they come and talk to it's very very intimate with the kids um, because I'm with them all day every day and um, so that's what I do now um, it's five now five years now that I that I do this job and I, and I love it and this is my class and um, uh, it's the best job in the world. I, I couldn't imagine to do something else. And it, it's funny because um, I started out actually in education when I, when I came to Cedar and I went into a second grade class to, to be a PA, a teacher's assistant. Um, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I was miserable. I was so miserable that I changed my major. I was like, no, no, this is not going to be, not going to be for me. And at that time, I thought that I would like to teach like seniors in college, in, in high school, or something like that. I would, I would be the cool teacher, you know. And um, after that experience in that second grade class, I was like, nah, that's not my my thing. And it's ironic because um, when I got this job, I started in the second grade, <laughs> and uh, but it was it was a, of course, I'm older now. I have. I have children of my own, so it's um, a little bit easier for me. And um, I've always loved kids, so so the kids respond to me well. I'm tall. Um, they they I mess around with them. I play with them and stuff like that. So it's it's a a, a great thing. And um, so yeah, that's pretty much my story. I, I I've got a pretty normal life: dog, cats, kids, wife. You know all of that kind of kind of stuff. Um, I don't, I don't do very much with basketball. I'm one of those all or nothing type of people. If, if I'm going to do it, then I do it 100% and I'm all in. And so when I changed, it, I was a little bit burned out. So I needed a little bit of time before I kind of got back into basketball. And then I, I think for one year, I didn't watch one game. Um, and then slowly, uh, I started coming back into it, and, and now I'm, I'm watching it a lot more, and I'm I'm thinking like a coach sometimes, which is which is kind of weird when I watch games, um, and um, I'm I'm more into it now, but I'll I'll never coach again. I know that because I'm just too much um, goal orientated, and um, and if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it 100, and I don't think that I would I would be good at it anymore because the game has changed even in the five years that I'm, that I'm not coaching anymore. And the time that I'm away, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that have changed. So not my thing for, for, for basketball anymore. I don't play anymore. Uh, I'm 47 years old. My body is not the, the athletic um, top performance that it was years ago. Um, I'm in actually pretty good shape, but I, I just, no. The only time a basketball sees me is when I go out to the to the court with my little daughter who's ten. She she plays, and I'll go play a little bit with her, and that's about it. So that's that's it for me with basketball. And now my 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 direction has changed to to um, different projects, and one of those projects is um, I, I talked just very shortly about it. Um, I've got I've gotten into writing. I've always been into really into writing, but I never wrote. Um, like a book and I wrote my first book now it's also based on on European basketball and it is a, a guide that should help college seniors um, and get them up to grip up to speed on how life is over here in Europe from my vantage point and, and um, what they have to prepare for during their senior year so that they have a, a good first year of being a rookie in Europe because there's a lot of people that don't know anything um, about coming over here to Europe. And I think if the, the athletes knew a little bit more information, then it would help them. So I, I finished my first book. It will go on sale in August. I'm doing all the um, pre-run-up stuff, uh, marketing now, and it's going pretty well. Um, Mindy wrote the foreword to my book. Mindy Larson wrote the foreword to my book, and she did a very good job. I, it's amazing what she wrote. Um, so I even read it from time to time to, to make myself feel good because she threw a lot of positive things in there. Um, and yeah, and, and so I'm, I've, I've got 
the first book done and I've got an idea for two more books also based on your, my European experience to help athletes. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the direction that, that my life is headed right now. And um, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying writing again and, and, and getting everything on, on, on my after, after basketball life in order. And I, 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 I would say I have a pretty boring life. I'm just a normal guy. I'm a six, eight guy walking around Germany, um, uh, writing books <laughs> and teaching, teaching little kids. Um, so that's my life right now. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> Sean, maybe share one or two of the most important tips from your book that uh, a graduating college senior should know in preparing to play professionally in Europe? Um, well, my book goes from basically from their senior, at the beginning of their senior year, all the way through their senior year and what they have to look forward to when they are looking for an agent or a contract overseas. And um, I, there's not one thing that I can say that really sticks out. It's just the experience as, a, as itself. It's a very educating um, book. It has a lot of stories from, from my life, from things that I experienced when I first came over that I didn't know, that I'm sure a lot of athletes, when they come over here, that they don't know. Um, so basically that was my, my intent, just to help these athletes um, be more informed and, and be ready for the challenge that they'll face. And maybe if I reach out to one athlete and it helps them to have a, a successful career, then, then, then I've done my job. And that's the, the most important thing that, that for me uh, motivated me to write the book. I, I, I wrote it actually about 14 or 15 years ago um, but back then I didn't get it published and um, it wasn't until August of last year of 2020 that I, I dusted it off and updated it and really investigated a little bit more on, on the topics that are in there um, and, and decided to, to give it another go and I'm self-publishing it. Um, but so far, I think it's, it's going to be okay. It's not, it's not, it's a niche book. It's not going to be on the New York Times bestseller. Um, I understand that, but that's not my motivation. That wasn't my motivation behind writing the book. It was just to help these athletes be better prepared. And that was, that's something that I wish I would have known um, how, to, how to choose an agent, for example, um, um, a standard European contract, what it looks like, the, 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 um, the um, I can't think of the word, the, the titles in a contract and what to look for. Um, these are things that of course, uh, 22, 23 year old guys and, and girls, they've never seen these things before. And, and so they have to have some kind of knowledge what, what different contracts could look like and what could be offered. And I think um, that that's a, a huge help. Oh, Ron, wait, yeah. one more thing. Um, actually, my book is due out on August 15th. But on Saturday, my time, um, I'm doing the release, the, the cover release. But for you guys, I'll show you guys now what the book looks like. And this is the book. It's called Same Name, Different Game. Um, and this is the cover. And it's got me on the back. I'm pretty happy about that. My smiling, chin and cheesy grin. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, and, and I'm really proud of it. And um, so you guys got to see it first. It won't, the cover release will be on Saturday, um, but you guys got to see it first. And uh, let's do something spontaneous. Let's, um, let's do a book giveaway. I'll, um, I, I can only do it on Instagram. If any of you are on Instagram, you can follow me on same underline name, underline different, underline game. Um, you can find me on there. I'll make a post um, pretty soon. And let's do it like this, that the, the person who guesses my favorite European Jersey number in the comment section of my Instagram post will win the book. Or if somebody doesn't get it, whoever comes closest. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post the winner on, on Instagram. 
And uh, so what you're looking for is my favorite European jersey number. What number I had the most and my favorite one. Kaler, the name is same, underline, name, underline, different, underline, game. Same name, different game. Um, that's the title of the book. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's my Instagram page. Um, so whoever is the closest or guesses it correctly will uh, win, win a book and I'll contact you through Instagram and I'll send it out to you, no problem. It'll be a little bit early, but but let's do something spontaneous. Thank you very much, Sean. That's exciting. Anyone have any questions for Sean? Any more questions? If not, uh, be sure and follow him on Instagram. Uh, this webinar will be posted uh, probably next week at su.edu slash alumni slash forever. So if you want to share it with others, They'll be available there and, and thank you all and Sean, thank you very much for staying up so late there in Germany. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and it's a, it's a real honor for me to do this for the Alumni Association and I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon. <laughs>